Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today, and I actually recorded this quite a few months ago, and it has to do with the Claire nuns when they had the task of repairing the Shroud of Turn after it was burned in a fire, and uh, the Shroud was the Holy Grail. I have connected it on every single level to this original Jesus story that came out of Odessa, Turkey, and the Holy Image. But where does the Holy Grail legend, where does that originate from? Well, it comes from a book or a writing that was written just a couple years after the Knights Templar acquired the Shroud of Turin, and they put out a cover story that uh, in uh, later writings that were based on this, that the Holy Grail was a cup, and that has kept people looking for the Holy Grail in the wrong place ever since. But what does this original story say the Holy Grail was? Well, this comes from a writing called La Quest del Saint Graal, and it says, The worthy knights who have completed the quest hear Mass said by Bishop Josephus, son of Joseph of Arimathea, who just, by the way, bought the linen that the Jesus character was buried in, who had survived for years on miraculous hosts from the Grail. At the moment of consecration, there descended from above a figure like unto a child whose countenance glowed and blazed bright as fire. And that is directly associated to the grail or the shroud ceremonies coming from Odessa, Turkey. And I've shown that in many videos where the child, it's a gradual progression. And the last thing that is shown is the holy image. And it says, whose countenance glowed and blazed bright as fire, and he entered the bread, which quite distinctly took on a human form before the eyes of those assembled there. Later Josephus vanished, and the company saw the figure of a man appear from out of the vessel, unclothed and bleeding from his hands and feet and side. And if they saw the figure of a man that appeared to have the crucifixion wounds coming out of the Holy Grail, well then the Holy Grail can only be the Shroud of Turin. So I just thought I would uh, point that out to the people who think the Holy Grail does not exist. It does and we still have it today and it is proven. It does have blood on it and it comes from this original Jesus story that I have talked about in all my videos. But I will just go on and play that reading of the Clare Nuns repairing the Shroud. Hope you enjoy it. The Delivery of the Shroud to the Clare Nuns On Wednesday, April 15th, 1534, the Most Serene Duke of Savoy, Charles III, and Legate Louis de Garavaud, before the Vespers, sent us Mr. Vesperit, treasurer of the Saint-Chapelle, together with some other canons, in order to inform us to be ready to receive the most saint shroud they had to bring us so that we could mend it where the fire had burnt it. Our Reverend Mother Abbess, Louise de Vargen, after thanking them, sent to answer on behalf of all the community that we were ready to obey His Highness and the Legate's orders, although we felt unworthy of having been entrusted such a holy task. Therefore the choir was adorned as well as we could, and there, after the Vespers, they carried the table on which they used to lay the holy relic. The following day, Thursday, April 16th, towards eight in the morning, while all the bells were ringing, a general procession was made in which the Monsignor Leggett carried the Holy Shroud, followed by His Highness, Monch Monsignor Bishop of Ballet, and Monsignor Suffragan, besides the apostolistic notary, several canons and ecclesiastics, and the main nobles of the country. After having put the shroud on the high altar of our church for a short time, they carried it into the choir on the table that had been prepared to spread the shroud on it. We received it in a procession with lit candles. They spread it on the table in order to examine the parts to be mended. Meanwhile, Monsignor Leggett asked all the counts and barons who were present if it was the same shroud they had seen on previous occasions, and they, after diligently examining it on one side and the other, testified that it was one and the same. The apostolistic notary took note of it, while those who were replaced by other nobles and priests who were asked in the same way. After that, Monsignor Leggett told our Reverend Mother to choose some of her nuns to mend it. She offered herself with three others whom she designated for the task, then all gave 
Then all four gave their names to the notary in the presence of all the nobles. Monsignor Leggett threatened the major excommunication against those who, have, who would have touched it except for the four chosen nuns. Then the ordinary preacher of His Highness delivered a beautiful sermon on the Holy Shroud in front of the choir grill, which was opened wide. The preacher was turned on the people's side, and at the end of the speech he read the apostolic, apostolistic Brevi His Holiness, and sent his highness, by which he allowed the poor daughters of the St. Clair's rule of chambery to repair it. The crowd who had rushed to see the precious relic was so great that you could hardly turn. After reading the brevet, Monsignor Leggett exhorted us to take the utmost care of it and to pray God that he could grant us the grace to complete this holy deed according to his holy will. After having us say the confidior, he gave us all this absolution. Everybody withdrew except the treasurer and the canon Lambert who had had the care of the holy shroud by his highness. In the afternoon the embroiderer carried the wood of the frame to fix the holland cloth on which the holy shroud had to be put. After the two hours of fixing the holland cloth on the loom and the ties we spread the precious holy shroud on it and sewed it all around with fox fillet. His Highness came with the legate and a lot of priests, canons, and nobles before we had begun to put pieces of the corporals in the areas damaged by the fire. He asked our opinion on this relic, but we all shared his, because we thought it the most reasonable. There was such a crowd at our grill while we worked that we could not do much, and this forced Mr. Audenay, His Highness Chambermaster, to ask the canon Lambert to go out often in order to make them withdraw beyond the guards put there to prevent disorders. When His Highness knew that there was such a large flow of people that there was no day without more than a thousand people, he took the grill key, which, however, he gave back to his chamber master in order to satisfy the holy wish of a great number of pilgrims who came from Rome, Jerusalem, and many other countries far away. The holy shroud was thrown with many lit candles while we sang kneeling. The people cried mercy loud with the devotion feelings that could not be expressed and went back extremely comforted, comforted, saying that was the same shroud they had seen on other occasions. Since the first day they brought us the shroud, Thursday, April 16th, between 7 and 8 in the evening, they sent us many nobles who, after greeting the Reverend Mother and all the community, told her they had been ordered to put guards in front of our grill in order to stay up during the night at the Holy Shroud, and, although His, High, His Highness trusted us, he did it out of proper respect for the sacred pledge of our Savior in order to avoid any kind of incidents. As a lot of foreigners had come to see the shroud, they executed the order and then let the grill curtain be opened. Mr. Mayor also carried other nobles so that they could stay up too. In the meantime, we always kept a big lit candle on a plate in front of the relic where four guards assisted holding lit candles and alternating with such a great modesty that they were more similar to novices of a congregation and a reformed one than to laymen. Our visitor mother thanked them because they did not give any trouble and they answered her that His Highness had ordered this way. They insisted many times on our going to rest a little, except three or four of us that could have stayed up late by this holy object but we could not part with it and had obtained the permission from our Reverend Mother to remain there as long as we wished. If some sisters retired at about 10 or 11, they got up at midnight and all attended the matins. The others went to rest from 2 to 4, and many of us stayed up even all night with incredible joy. All our conversations were with God. Description of what can be seen on the Shroud let our look go up and down through all the bleeding wounds of his holy body, whose prints appeared on this holy shroud. It seemed to us as if the side opening, as the most significant opening of the heart, said these words incessantly to us, All ye that pass by, behold and see if there may be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. In fact, on the small picture we saw sufferings that could never be imagined. We also saw on it the traces of a face all bruised and tortured by blows. His divine head pierced by big thorns from blood rills came out of and bled onto the forehead and divided in various rills covering the forehead in, with the most precious purple of the world. On the left side of the forehead we noticed one greater and longer drop than the others, which winds like a wave. 
His eyebrows look very delineated, his eyes a little less. His nose, as the most prominent part of the face, is very marked. His mouth is well put and rather small. The swollen, disfigured cheeks, let us guess, perceive they have been cruelly hit, and particularly the right one. His beard is neither long nor too small in the style of the Nazarenes. It looks sparse in some areas because it has been partially pulled away out of contempt and the blood had stuck the rest. Then we saw a long trace coming down the neck, which made us think that he had been bound with an iron chain during the capture in the Garden of Gethsemane. Since the neck looks swollen in various points as if it had been pulled and shaken, the bruises and scourge blows on the stomach are so thick that a, pin a pinhead large zone free from blows could hardly be found. The scourge blows intercross continuously and extended all along the body as far as the feet tips. The large blood clots marks the feet opening on the left hand side, which is very marked and crossed on the right one, whose wounds it covers. The nail holes are in the middle of the long and beautiful hands, and there are blood rill winds from the ribs to the shoulders. The arms are somewhat long and beautiful and in such a position that they show the entire stomach cruelly tortured by scourge blows. The side wound appears as wide as to allow the passage of three fingers surrounded by a four-fingered wide blood trace narrowing from below and approximately a half a foot long. On the second half of this holy shroud, which represents our Savior's back, you can see the head and nape pierced by long and big thorns, which are so thick that you can understand the crown was like a hat, and not like a circle as a prince's crowns and the ones represented by painters. If you look at it carefully, you can notice the nape more tortured than the rest, and the thorns stuck more deeply with large drops of blood coagulated in this completely stained with blood hair. The blood traces under the nape are larger and more visible than the others, since the sticks they hit the crown with made the thorns enter as far as the brain, so that, having received mortal wounds, it was a miracle he did not die under the blows. Moreover, the wounds opened again because of the jolt of the cross when the ladder was put in the hole, and before that when they made him fall on the cross in order to nail him to it. The shoulders are completely tortured and stormed by scourge blows which are everywhere. The drops, the blood drops appear as wide as sweet marjoram leaves in several areas. There are large fractures because of the blows they gave him. In the middle of the body, you can notice the signs of the iron chain tying him to the column so tightly that he appeared all stained with blood. The variety of blows shows that they use different kinds of scourge, such as rods with thorns twisted around, iron ropes lacerating him so cruelly that, watching the shroud from below, when it was spreading on the backing holland cloth, we could see the wounds as if we watched through a glass window. All the nuns contemplated it very carefully with a consolation that cannot be expressed, and through these beautiful prints, we could see that he truly was the fairest among the sons of men, according to David's prophecy, who foretold it in one of his psalms. And it says the shroud withdrawal on the eve of the liturgical festival. During the fifteen days this precious relic remained in our convent, we could not find comfort of confessing to approach the most sacred sacrament of the altar to receive the Son of God, while we had part of him in front of our eyes in his image printed with his own blood. We finally confessed at the wheel on Monday and Tuesday, April 27th and 28th, and on Wednesday we fulfilled our devotion. On that day, His Highness had to come to see where the works on the Holy Shroud had got to, but, fearing to disturb us, he waited for the following morning, Thursday, April 30th, at about seven, to give orders about how to wrap the shroud in the violet taffeta. After doing this, they had brought us some cloths besides the ones we had already had. On Friday, May 1, all the inside and the outside was stretched, and they decided that the following day, Saturday, May 2nd, they would take they would take it. The festival had been celebrated on May 4 since 1506. On that day, Monsignor Bishop of Belle, Monsignor Suffragan, and many other priests, clergymen, and nobles came. They watched what we had done and approved it. 
Then they raise the shroud in order to let us see it once again, folded it on the roll with red silk veil. Monsignor came in Monsignor came in procession exactly in the same way as when he had brought it to us as the two doors of the convent. All the town bells rang besides the trumpets and other symphonies. Meanwhile, the bishops covered the holy shroud with a golden cloth and carried it away. We all began to sing the hymn, Jesus Nostra Redemptio, Jesus Our Redemption. We all had lit candles. Finally, with all the possible devotions, the bishop gave the shroud to his highness, who was waiting for them between the two doors. The holy shroud was taken to the castle with great solemnity, and we remain poor orphans of him who had visited us so benignly with his holy image. And that is a story of the mending of the Shroud of Turin by the nuns, by the Clare nuns in 1534. I just thought that was a very interesting story, gave some good detail. Hope you thought this was interesting, and you have a nice day.